Okay. So given that, I want to introduce uh, Nick Lapos. He's the president of the Vertical Lift Consortium. Um, Nick's been around forever, or, or at least forever since I've been doing this in the, in the uh, 80s. Um, test pilot, par excellence, been to several companies. He's a tech fellow. I don't know what else to say, Nick, other than a good friend. Over to you, brother. <laughs> Well, we've had a lot of fun working together, Bill. So I appreciate it. And let me uh, let me uh, start off by saying that what Bill has presented to you is very much the industry vision. You you've got it there. Um, I, I, is my audio coming well, uh, Jim? Are we in good shape? Yeah, we're good. Yep. Good. All right. Can I have my first slide, please? Let me start off with uh, just a, just a discussion with the folks. Um, the most important thing I could say about what the industry vision is is we have to recognize that the digital means that we're talking about should change our game. We can't translate what we're doing today digitally and then just do it again. And let me offer an example of that. Uh, I cut my teeth in the beginning with the digital transformation of our aircraft, working with fly-by-wire systems and with the engine fuel controls. One of the engine manufacturers came up with a digital fuel control using uh, good, solid uh, digital technology back in the 1970s. And what they did was took the entire hydromechanical unit and describe it digitally, even so much as to have areas where there were accumulators and, and uh, springs and valves and stuff and have them described digitally. So what they did was they translated the entire fuel control system, not as a digital entity, but as an analog equivalent digitally. And we must avoid that. We go to the second slide and, and uh, put that up. Okay, so the first thing I'll, I'll, I'll ask us all to do is not digitally translate. Don't codify analog answers digitally. Let's go back and do them properly. If you know what Bill had talked about, the idea of collecting all the teams together, um, I'm going to offer some examples that are shocking. We design a transmission, we design a rotor blade, we design an airframe. They're all independent. They're designed by separate teams, and each one has an interface document of how they relate to the other one. We have to make that interface document enormous and start to blur it so that we have one design team and one design. And we don't have stovepipes. We have to be very careful of that. Um, the second bullet is very important, too. What is a cyber physical entity? Uh, I heard that first from Dave Arterburn and from, and from Bill Lewis, who, who talked about the idea of cyber physical entities. Let's recognize that the aircraft actually depends on the cybernetics as importantly as it depends on the, on the spars of the rotor blades. And that, in fact, the digital connections and the data transfers that, that take place are as important in the decision making and flight safety as is the structure itself. When you trust the digital system that much, then you're going to get the benefits. Until you trust them that much, you won't get the benefits. So build your cyber systems to be that reliable and that and that strong. Um, digitization breaks down barriers, make system level analysis wherever possible. That is the whole system and not just subsystems of it. I, I note that our modeling is often done that way. If you look at our models these days, you find digital models that are compartments for all the different sub elements of a system. As much as we can, we have to look at the interfaces between those compartments and be sure we end up with the total model of the total system. And I think it's very important to notice that. Once you do that, the idea we should do is to focus on how to reduce cost and to reduce development time and to seek commonality of our systems. Very, very important to do so. And I'll use the word commonality again and again here. Uh, we have to be sure that the systems that we build, um, we don't reinvent every time we have a new helicopter. Uh, I, I, we've talked about that, and we in the industry think, it's very important for us to recognize that if you have a new generator control unit every time you build a flying machine, then we're going to spend a lot of money on generator control units. But once we have one that works very well, why don't we use it on many different aircraft? And, and uh, in doing so, save the cost and save the uh, development time and the troubleshooting that takes place during the development cycle. And I would ask you, too, please recognize that the, the people who built our industry, uh, Igor and, and Art and Frank Piasecki, these are people who had a vision and they knew what they were doing. What would they do if they had the tool set we have? Uh, do as much as we can to leave the page and change the game. All right, and the trick is to make development faster, better, and simpler. If we haven't done that, we haven't done our jobs. Next slide, please. 
cyber physical system. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into it in great detail. These are mostly for reference, so that you didn't. I didn't, wasn't using terms that we didn't define. But basically, the cybernetic elements of the system. That is the analysis of the data, the sensing that takes place in real time, the analysis of the data that takes place in not real time. All of that stuff is as important as the fundamental structure of the aircraft. Until we've done that. Um, we, we have not made a cyber physical system. Please note too that this also includes the humans that are part of the system. If the humans can make a mistake and, and can befuddle the cybernetic system, then their capabilities have to be worked into as part of it. Next slide, please. Worldwide analytics. Uh, one of the important things that we can do when we're digital is to tie every airplane together. I'm going to contend that we haven't really achieved a cyber physical entity until we know every part of the aircraft individually for the entire fleet. And if, and if a spec four removes a part in North Korea that we can see that part came off and we have tied to that part its history and know what it went through so we know how to make the next one better. If we do that and we have complete connection of all the physical elements and the data elements, then we've got a system that will learn as it goes. And every day it gets more reliable and better and the warfighter has a better machine in their hands. Next slide, please. Let's recognize that digital flight controls, usage monitoring, continuous analysis, all of those are very much a part of the system we're describing. And we have to use them all to our advantage as much as possible. Uh, I believe that the idea of a usage monitoring system that has all the components of the aircraft is an extremely important part of what we're talking about. Next slide, please. If we do this and we drive ourselves to the point where our structures take advantage of all the digital monitoring there is, I want you to think of the overages that are built into every piece of the aircraft. If we could cash in on those overages because we didn't have to worry about the reliability of the system, that we knew that we were going to go to 1.0 design limit load factor, and we knew that we would be have safety right up to 1.0, how much more do we need out of the structure? 1.1, 1.2, today it's 1.5. Think about that from every single system in the aircraft. Hydraulic systems are designed to 50% overpressure. And that's important because we need it today. We don't have the control over it. If we did have, um, imagine a hydraulic system that had a dump valve and wouldn't let the pressure get any higher. Could we then make it lighter? The entire system gets lighter and better. Um, if you look at the way Voyager flew around the world and realize the marginal airplane that flew around the world but made it, you realize that they had basically an empty weight fraction of about 25%. Can we get a fleet airplane to 35 or 40 percent empty weight fraction instead of today's 55 or 60. If we can, then all that extra percentage goes in because the lift is there, the payload capacity is there, it goes into what the warfighter needs. It's another missile, it's another pound of gas, it's the way that we make our systems better and better at what they do. So my contention is this becomes the goal that we all have to drive toward. Next slide, please. And I'm back to the first slide again, because that's how, that's the closed loop that describes what we really want to end up with. And that is don't translate with digital. Let's, let's do the job differently and better as we do it. And I'll challenge each one of us to know their jobs well enough to be able to figure out how a digital environment can make it better. Next slide, please. And a prize goes to whoever knows who Eisenberg Kingdom Brunello is. Not only do you have the interesting name, but this guy was one of the best engineers that's ever lived. And what he said was, don't teach me rules because I'll write down the rule and next year someone will figure a better way and I'll be embarrassed at it. So I, I'm gonna contend that we're, we're busy writing the rules for the future. Let's make them open and let's get ourselves changing the game as much as we can. Now that's it, that's 10 minutes worth. And I would ask if there are any questions from the floor or from, from uh, out there in uh, cyberspace, uh, please pose them and let's have a little conversation going on. Okay, so it appears as though we don't have any questions um, from online. Um, <clears throat> are there any from our in-person attendees? Hey, hey, hey Nick, uh, Bill, 
I was, yeah. I was interested in, as we migrate down this business process discussion, how difficult from a VLC perspective, how difficult is it going to be for smalls to be competitive or involved with the bigs uh, as a part of the overall product development? That's a great question. And I think that the answer is that we're constructed at the VLC level and with the uh, with the OTAs that are mine, that the smalls have an impact. And you look for that, Bill, when you ask us for our contracts, because you're looking for the, uh, the, the smaller entities to come in. I must also say, too, that it's been my experience that the innovation we're describing sometimes occurs in, in a two person company where folks are very good at how to do a structure and they can they can propose changes. And if we together, the, the government and the VLC can let those ideas rise to the surface, they can help change our game. So my, my belief is that the smalls will be very important, the, the non-traditionals and the small entities, very important for innovation. And that if they do it properly, we may find that the bigs can learn from the smalls. And, and uh, we're not against that at all. Anybody, anybody got anything else? So is the vision on this that everyone's working in the same database, the same digital um, environment so i'm not off on my own desktop doing my own thing and then i upload my final product isn't that basically the same as a paper product so that everybody can see where i am and what i'm doing yeah the question, what a great question yeah, yep i heard it exactly and the answer is heck no we, we have uh, one of our difficulties the tower of babel the tool sets that we're using are all somewhat different we're mercifully all tied to Katia to an extent because Katia is so universal and so powerful that it has become the de facto standard for at least the physical geometry of the machine. Uh, so I, I think there's some commonality there. But what a great question. And it really it behooves us to figure out how to have the right amount of data transfer that takes place, even if you have different tool sets. I'm reminded very much of the way ASCII code works. One of the great powerful things about the construction of the internet was JPEG, MPEG, uh, ASCII, all of those standards forced us to have the interchange of data uh, that was transparent. So your question is an excellent one. And I'll, I'll say that I think it's going to behoove us to have industry work together with the government to come up with some sets of standards for how those interfaces are. Frankly, it gets into the idea of a MOSA for the design phase, as well as MOSA for the produced product. And, and Bill, I'll ask you for your comments on that. No, I, I, I agree. I, I think that you have to be able to, you know, the model that you worked on on your home computer will have to be able to interact with the bigger, the global models that are, that are out there. And that's the key. That was kind of the tie between bigs and smalls, because how do you do that? What's the best way to do that? Lars, you got yes. comment? I'd kind of like to take a little bit of issue with that. Uh, the approach we're on, the trajectory we're on, largely does have single source of truth. And the hard part is letting people do sandbox work on LREU's components, unit supportability, uh, component spec models at the architectural level, and then bring them into the single source of truth. But if you look at uh, the responsibility of a, of a project manager, you know, so an 06 project manager has life cycle configuration control responsibility uh, from the time he takes the technology from the ST community to the day he retires it out of sustainment. He's responsible for configuration flow control of the items he produces and then helps sustain along with AMCOM, AMC, and SRD. And the vision we have is that, that his is the, the single source of authoritative truth for both the design and the implementation via the bomb. So the, the, if you will, the production manufacturing service bomb and the sustainment bomb uh, as done in the digital engineering, the product line manager item, similar on the MBSC side, which is largely before um, physical realization, the uh, work we do with the requirement holders, the stakeholders, uh, is held by the PM and then, if you will, our CFT, our, our, uh, 
uh, RDDs, the, the current term for what was Hickams and Hickams, uh, come into that and they go back out. And, and we have a chart that shows a relationship around the acquisition life cycle where there's a back and forth between like our RFPs out to industry with a model, with an MBSC, a SysML model. And then as they develop the allocated design and then the, if you will, the bombs, et cetera, and then other test data comes in, they're all working on that, but you have to fuse it into one place. So in the real time, one engineer at a time, no, you're not working against the, 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 the single baseline, but it is continuously integrated and updated through a CM and entry process, or you can't get the advantages. The hardest part uh, there in the now term, Dr. Lewis uh, referred to on the Comanche program, this drives our IT guys, or whatever you want to call them, nuts, because you're talking about having access for, uh, you know, what are usually very segregated na networks between the, 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 the PEOs, PMs, say ASALT, OSD, uh, the lab, uh, uh, if you will, our CETAs, and then now to our OEMs, and then doing all the, the, the uh, access control, IP control, so forth like that. We have approaches for it, but I think it's going to remain for some period of time the, the fundamental challenge of what we're trying to do. It's easier when you're forward. I mean, when you look at product line management and achievement, the automakers are maybe out front, uh, the big aerospace guys are, are out of front. But when you run your own company, now you only have like two of those gaps. You have yourself, your subs, your, your sub-subs. Uh, and, and you have very tight relationships with them. But one last thing. when when uh, the practitioners, um, when we're listening to briefs, uh, you can you can use a couple of words that, that if they use them, you know that they're, they're they're 20th century people. One of them is ICDs. If they say we're we're going to get together, we're going to set an ICD, I'm like they're not doing modeling, and, and I immediately know that they're behind the times and they need training. And so that's why we have triggers on on things where we know we haven't made that culture shift. And that's the uh, the work in progress. Within our PEO, we have a wide range of acceptance and utility, probably maximized by Flora. Flora's acquisition is a model-centered acquisition. They they came up with a model of most of the features of Flora, uh, quite a bit of the architecture work, and that went out via the RFP and is coming back in the proposals and the other aspects of the, the contract. So floor is going to be the front lines of the do it fight and it's a little interesting to watch our multi-billion dollar emd program be the start i see Dr. Lewis. let me let Dr. me gently Long. push back a little bit and and comment um recently a dutch firm has come out with a chip maker that can make a master chip that basically describes almost any system on a single chip as, as you well know you can have a chip that could be an ibm um, a computer, a mainframe computer on a single chip now. And this chip maker can actually build a chip that, that can take almost the entire operating system of a flying machine and have it on a series of chips on boards. And and when you look at, uh, I'll, I'll offer an example, a, a design like a Flora, you end up with 50 or 60 black boxes piled up that weigh a thousand pounds. Each one's got a power supply. Each one's got a whole bunch of cables and connectors and all kinds of other fun stuff and boy does that look like 1990 or what and and the future i don't think the future in the year 2050 is going to have 50 black boxes connected in a flying system so the question is how do we work together to build systems that have all that weight and power reduction uh, they're doing it on satellites right now and the idea of breadboards and so on so it's going to be an interesting way for us to transition into the future that maintains the most of that we want but it reduces the power requirements and the space requirements for our operating systems. Great. Nick, yeah. thank, you, my brother. thank you, my brother, for taking some time. So everybody knows Nick's living off the grid, and if he were to drop off, we were going to blame Elon Musk because he's running Tesla batteries in his house out there. <laughs> That's right, exactly. I got 48 <laughs> solar panels on my roof and 16 Tesla modules in the basement, and that's how I run. Well, thank you very much for the time, folks. I really appreciate it. And uh, Bill, thank you for running this show and getting us all thinking this way. Well, thanks, Nick. It's always, it's always good to talk to you.